Thanks to Star Trek Fleet Command for sponsoring this video. Star Trek, a famous series for its spaceships, technology, and heroic captains. It's just such a shame that it's all science fiction. Or is it? While Star Trek seems out of this world, it turns out that in the early 1960s, the US Air Force came up with the idea for a real-life interplanetary enterprise spaceship. One that could fly to other worlds, visit other peoples, and if needed, go to war to defend humanity. So what was this concept, and just how close is it to the fiction of Star Trek? And could it be built today? Let's explore the incredible, Star Trek-like Orion Battleship. In the 1960s, NASA, with the US Air Force, began to develop a new type of propulsion system, a nuclear drive. The idea was that using the awesome power of the atom, they could be able to launch huge spacecraft into deep space to explore the solar system and beyond without having to rely on fossil fuels. But the military, fearing the Soviets, or perhaps something much more, instead insisted that this science vessel could be capable of warfare, with shuttles, science crew and military personnel all on board, and enough nukes to wipe out a country off the map. Essentially, it would become a Star Trek Enterprise in real life, although far more militaristic, making it the perfect comparison to science fiction. Initially developed by General Atomics back in the 1950s, they created a 4,000 ton nuclear pulse propulsion spacecraft. It would have a crew of 120, ranging from scientists, space marines, and of course the captain and its bridge crew. This is much smaller than Star Trek, which had a crew of around 400 in the original series Enterprise. But some ships on the show, such as the USS Antares, only had 20 personnel, so this real life version is relatively feasible. The cool part is, you wouldn't have to imagine what it would be like to control a ship like this, or Starfleet, thanks to today's video sponsor, Star Trek Fleet Command. In this awesome free game that's on iOS, Android and Windows, you get to engage in a story-driven Star Trek galaxy with your own fleet of starships and iconic characters. They have everyone from all the franchises from Spock to Data to Michael Burnham. Explore the entire Star Trek universe with real-time combat and mysteries that only you can solve. And it gets better, with Deep Space Nine is finally coming to Star Trek Fleet Command. This new arc will offer something for everyone with three new officers focused on ship survivability, new missions, and introducing Alliance Starbases. Players within an alliance will be able to now work together to build a starbase, control resources, and receive buffs for their alliance. We also have all the Deep Space crew in this version, including Miles O'Brien, who perhaps you'll finally be able to save from suffering. So if this is right up your alley and you want to customize your dream crew of iconic characters and have starships with unique powers to make you stand out as the strongest in the galaxy, then click that link in the description or scan that QR code. You're not only getting a fun free game that's on Windows, iOS and Android, but you're also supporting the channel and letting me keep making animations that you love just like this one. Make it so, audience. But let's just touch back to the real-life Orion concept. Apart from the bridge, it would have also had an internal centrifuge to supply limited gravity, vast storage bays for supplies, entertainment, living quarters, and much more. But just like a Federation starship, it would have its own fleet of six shuttles as well. These shuttles, called landing boats in this context, would allow the ship to arrive at another planet objects like the Moon or Mars to send down science teams or if coming across other ships, board them without docking the whole mothership. Compared to the Star Trek shuttles, we can see the similarities. They were able to fly 20 passengers each and had a range of versatile functions, but didn't have the ability to go very far into deep space. Now, let's talk about the weapons. Star Trek's ships, such as the Enterprise, have two major weapons, phasers and photon torpedoes. 
The phases are more like a stream of particles than an actual laser beam, like shooting out heavy atomic particles from a gun. The other major weapon that is used throughout the series is the Photon Torpedo, an antimatter warhead rocket that can hit with incredible firepower, the equivalent of the largest nuke ever made, the Soviet Tsar Bomb. The Orion battleship, for comparison, has roughly the same weaponry. I'm not kidding. Its equivalent phaser would be something that even today is highly classified, called the Kasabar Howitzer. This was a launched nuclear shell that would detonate once fired, sending a stream of deadly plasma X-rays in a shaped charge towards the target, melting anything it came across. The battleship would carry several of these warheads on board and they would be ideal for shooting Soviet ICBMs out of the sky. And in terms of photon torpedoes, well, we have the good old standard nuclear warhead. The ship would carry around 500 of these 20 megaton city killer warheads that it could use to bomb any country, alien or human, off the map. It would have an internal conveyor belt system to reload them to the 30 launch bays, as well as its propulsion system, which I'll get to in a minute. In addition, it also had three 5-inch Navy cannons and associate ammo on board to give it its battleship name, and several Gatling cannons for defense, much like ships have today. Simply ludicrous. So I bet you're thinking, how exactly would this thing fly around the solar system, or even get to other stars? In Star Trek, there are a few different ways that a spacecraft or starship can fly around, the most famous which is the warp drive. If you're unfamiliar, this works by compressing subspace in front of the ship and expanding it behind, pushing the spacecraft forward in a bubble of sorts. And I know this explanation is very light on the details for those Star Trek fans out there. With this technology, however, humanity and the Federation of Planets as a whole is able to cruise around our universe at faster than the speed of light. But what about the Air Force design? Would it use a similar concept? Not quite. The nuclear weapons on board the spacecraft were not just there for offensive capabilities, but were also there for propulsion. That's right, these crew members would be riding around pretty much on top of a nuclear warhead. They would launch a nuke behind the ship and detonate. The shockwave would then radiate out into what is known as the pusher plate, giving the entire spacecraft a powerful push. The pusher plate would be mounted on two large two-stage shock absorbers that it would smoothly transmit the acceleration to the rest of the spacecraft. This would be done multiple times until it got up to speed using a range of nukes from 140 kilos to up to a ton, and they would look somewhat like a depth charge. These charges would dispense from what looked like a vending machine apparatus, so much so that the Air Force actually consulted with Coca-Cola in the design of this machinery. I'm not kidding. At an acceleration of 10 days, firing every 1.1 seconds with up to 300,000 warheads being used, thank goodness there's no sound in space, the ship could reach 10,000 kilometers per second, which is around 3.3% the speed of light, and take around 133 years to reach the nearest star, Alpha Centauri. This is where Star Trek comes back into the picture and it gets seriously cool. Warp drives in the series are powered by antimatter and allow them to fly beyond the speed of light, doing trips to other stars in hours, not years. For the Orion, a typical fission nuke that is common in warheads would only allow it to reach 3% the speed of light, but if we swap that out for antimatter charges, it would be possible to reach 50 to 80% the speed of light. A nuclear pulse drive starship powered by fusion antimatter catalyzed nuclear pulse propulsion units would be similar to 10% the speed of light, and a pure matter antimatter annihilation rockets could theoretically capable of pushing it up to 80%. That would mean reaching other stars such as Alpha Centauri in 44 years at 10%, 22 years at 50%, and under 10 years for 80% meaning you could visit other stars in a lifetime, even multiple times. This doesn't account for slowing down, of course, but they prepared other methods like flipping the spacecraft around and firing to deaccelerate, or energy-saving tech like solar sails. 
Side note, just like Star Trek, the ship would actually have artificial gravity due to the acceleration. When reaching the near light speeds, the constant acceleration would be kept at Earth gravity. This same could be said for its deacceleration towards the destination, giving those on board actual gravity for a duration of the trip. And when not accelerating, they would use the centrifuge on board. And while not exactly the same speeds as warp travel, we could actually build this starship to visit other stars today. So why was this insane spacecraft never built and our dream of beating the Kobarashi Maru scenario could never happen? This Orion spacecraft was the perfect solution to the question of how to visit Mars, Saturn's moons, and eventually other stars. There were plans drawn up for hypothetical manned missions to Saturn by the 1970s in an Orion-powered ship that would be built by ship fitters in Virginia along the east coast because of the heavy-duty steel construction experience. That would be preferable to the lightweight aerospace techniques that were used for aircraft. They visualize a flying city in space that could be launched by the late 1960s, which to them was incredibly doable. Technological problems would be overcome, but modern engineering hadn't found any silver bullets yet that would have condemned such an effort. Environmental and political problems, sure, such as using nukes in outer space, but not engineering. But it was the final presidential seal of approval that sealed its fate. The team got as far as presenting a large scale model of the Orion battleship to then President Kennedy in the early 1960s. But alas, this highly detailed model, brimming with weapons and nukes and all sorts of folly, totally put the president off and he quickly cancelled the program. As it turns out, sending a ship to space that while on paper matches that of a Star Trek Enterprise, it doesn't match the ethos of the peace and the federation. It would certainly not put the Soviets at ease and would undoubtedly further deepen the Cold War. And as Scott Lawther said from aerospaceprojectsreview.com, one, on the other hand, had the United States actually fielded a full-size Orion battleship, the US would have not only unquestionably got space dominance, it would have also had the first major steps towards a true interplanetary transport and commerce. Rather than limping to Mars in a small aluminium bubble, hello Elon Musk, following minimal energy requirements to save every last gram of fuel, the US would have had ships that could carry thousands of tons of payload and hundreds of passengers. Ironically, this project wrapped up just as Star Trek went to air only three years later. You have to wonder if the creator of Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry, knew something that we didn't. What do you think? Did he have an inside angle at the Air Force? And if you enjoyed this video, I also suggest you check out my other channel, Escape Velocity. There I'll be talking more detail about this technology and the rest of the Orion program, and I can't wait to see your thoughts. Oh, and don't forget that Deep Space Nine is arriving to Star Trek Fleet Command. Star Trek Fleet Command is available for free on iOS, Android, and Windows. Download now using my link below or by scanning the QR code and join the fight.